Hi, and welcome to all of you who have joined us. I am Elise Hugh from TED Talks Daily, the podcast, and a longtime correspondent at NPR. We're going to give you just a minute for everybody to join. And hopefully you can see me soon. All right, for those of, who's, those of you who can see and hear me, I'm not sure since um, I don't get to see you all. Uh, my name is Elise Hugh. I am the host of TED Talks Daily, the podcast, which you can download Monday through Friday, and a longtime correspondent at NPR. Welcome to the first of a series of virtual conversations from UCLA Connections. And what we're going to do is bring you experts from UCLA on topics that we care about during these difficult and overwhelming times that we're living and living through right now it's unprecedented and so uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to be able to kind of get together virtually and talk about topics today healthy eating is our big topic um, I'm gonna start with a little housekeeping first the chat and the Q&A functions have been disabled for this conversation on zoom but you can tweet at me if you have any questions throughout the um, about 20 20 minute moderated chat that I'm going to have with our expert and then we're going to leave the last 10 minutes or so for questions from you. So if you do have any questions throughout the first 20 minutes or so, you can message me at Elise WHO at Elise who and I am pleased to be able to welcome today our UCLA expert. Um, her name is Dr. Danielle Keenan Miller. She is hello. Hi. Um, she is the director of the UCLA Psych Clinic, and she's a specialist in disordered eating, which isn't to say that we are accusing any of you of having disordered eating patterns right now, but our, our eating has certainly been affected by the stress of this time period. And so let's jump into it with you, Dr. Keenan Miller, just off sure. the bat. Uh -huh. um, what is your message to those of us who are either just not hungry and just not eating as we typically did when our lives had a different kind of routine mm -hmm. or people like me who find ourselves just running to the fridge every couple of minutes and snacking like crazy, um, which is also unusual and different. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those of us who have found our um, relationship with food to be quite changed during this time period? I would say that's a pretty common, uh experience that people are having that eating one of the most fundamental parts of our lives and our daily routines is as disrupted as the other parts of our lives are really during this time. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One of which you mentioned is routine, right? Um, the sort of time markers in our day that usually indicate when to start eating and when to stop eating are gone for many people. Like you might have been in an office setting where you left for an hour of lunch and when you came back, eating was over. And we're not in that kind of context anymore. Lots of people are home and in environments where there's lots of access to food. And I think there are two other really big reasons that people's relationship to how to food and how they eat has shifted. Um, one of those reasons is a sense of deprivation that a lot of people are experiencing. Um, and we know that um, deprivation, real deprivation, as in not getting enough food during the day, but also psychological deprivation, the sense that you can't um, have the foods that you need and want, those can contribute to overeating. Um, it can mm -hmm. ironically sort of make people more likely to binge eat uh, when they're feeling deprived. And that is certainly a circumstance lots of people find themselves in these days where they're worried about the availability and accessibility of food. And then we also know that um, food uh, is something that people use both biologically and psychologically to regulate their emotions. So it makes sense that in times of stress, people are trying to figure out how to modulate their eating to help with their emotional state as well. So given that there are real psychological and social reasons for us to be doing this and really emotional ones, since there is such a link between um, stress and um, eating and yeah. our eating habits, uh, how do we approach this time period in a way that's maybe a little bit more healthy or maybe 
um, in a way that doesn't feel like it's so out of control. <laughs> because I think a lot of us, you know, um, there's a lot of memes going around, which I don't know, which I want to get to also, but about sort of uh, weight gain that's happening <laughs> during this time period. So what is your advice about how to maintain a healthy relationship with food during such an unusual time period? Well, I would say actually you just hit on one of the major points, which is to focus on health rather than weight as the main goal in how you're going about eating. And healthy eating um, involves eating a, a variety of foods that have nutritional value, but that also have pleasure and are satisfying. Um, and it's really um, important, especially during these times, but also during our uh, pre-COVID lifestyle to really think about um, health as the outcome that we're focused on rather than weight. Um, the other thing that can be really helpful as a tool right now is for people to build in some routine and some structure to their eating um, to help replace some of what we've lost. So it's a good idea to plan for three meals and two snacks, which for some people will feel like not enough and other people, right. like, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much food. Um, but we know from a lot of psychological research that that is sort of the eating pattern that supports most people eating in a healthful way. And to really have those planned out in advance so that you don't end up standing in front of your refrigerator at 11 p.m. starving because you've under eaten and you missed a snack. And now you're just sort of eating whatever is in front of you and you feel really out of control in those moments. So actually bringing an intentional sort of mindful and um, structured way to think about your eating can help combat some of those feelings. I'm glad you brought up this idea of sort of intention because a lot of us are also at home with children yes. um, and they have their entire lives kind of upended as well, yeah. especially because their parents are now their teachers, yes. <laughs> which is a questionable <laughs> situation. But um, because not only are we having, as adults, having to be a little bit more intentional, what should we be thinking about in terms of feeding our children who kind of want to snack and graze all day also because they are at home 24 seven as well? Yeah, I think again, it's really helpful to think about how can we replicate in the home environment a little bit of the structure that helps contain kids, not only their eating behaviors, but also their emotions in the school environment, right? So um, I have a toddler myself at home and at school there's snack time and snack time starts and then it closes and I'll give her a warning like snack time is about to close. This is your last serving of fruit or whatever it is and sort of indicate to, to kids sort of when, um, when eating time starts and stops. And also it's really important that parents model um, psychologically healthy um, relationship with food um, in front of their kids. So okay. not criticizing children for the choices that they make, offering them options that are satisfying and both pleasurable and helpful um, are really, really important. I know you are an expert in uh, binge eating, mm -hmm. and um, even though some of us might be joking about the way that we're eating now, how do we know whether we're just sort of coping with a difficult time or whether we've kind of stumbled into eating disorder territory? What are signs that we should be looking out for or recognizing in ourselves? That's a really good question, and there isn't um, a sort of bright line. There, it's really mm -hmm. a spectrum for people, but um, when we think about binge eating, we're thinking not of any particular like calorie amount that someone eats. It's more right. about eating more than would be expected in the circumstance, but also eating in a way that feels out of control and mm -hmm. eating in a way that has negative repercussions. So physical discomfort, shame, guilt, hiding eating from other people, if you're having a really strong and powerful negative reaction, um, emotional reaction to the way that you're eating, that's usually a sign that something is off in that relationship and whether or not it crosses the line into an eating disorder that regardless, it might be the kind of thing that you wanna either read a self-help book about or reach out for some professional support around. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you. So if we are finding ourselves maybe questioning the way that we're coping with food, what is your advice? What should we be doing? Yeah, there are um, lots of uh, professionals who are doing uh, therapy over telehealth. And if you look at uh, some of the websites, like um, the website for the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, um, it will tell you which providers are taking on new clients via telehealth. So if you, if you feel like you're having concerns in the eating domain that you 
a professional might need to support, um, that would be the place that I would start. Behavioral and cognitive therapies, often called CBT, um, are the sort of front uh, frontline treatment for eating disorders. But for a lot of other people, um, they can do some uh, work themselves by uh, joining some online support groups, um, by reading self-help books, if that's of use to them. And also I think of trying to take a, a sort of deeper fundamental shift in their relationship to food and themselves away from potentially unattainable ideas of perfection and towards a stance that's really about self-compassion, especially during this really difficult time. Uh, we are living through a global crisis and the survival and health of your body is so much more important in this moment than your weight or shape or size. And if you can sort of start to make that shift during this time, that compassion might actually continue on in your life. You might be able to affect a long-term change even when this is over. Well, Dr. Keenan Miller, I, I know that you still do see patients, but you're also a researcher. And so I wanted to ask you, because we have this opportunity to tap UCLA experts, what you've seen in your re research or the research of your peers within the last you know, few years or decade or so in this um, sort of healthy eating and disordered eating space that uh, might shed some light for us and help us better understand um, this moment we're in and or just eat disordered eating in general? Yeah, I think some of what we've learned in the last decade or so um, has really helped to illuminate the ways in which um, it's not just a matter of willpower, how much people mm -hmm. eat or whether or not they end up doing things like binge eating. I think a lot of people experience an intense cycle of shame if they feel out of control in relation to food. But we're really learning, even on a biological level, that experiences like stress cause us to release more of ghrelin, which is commonly called the hunger hormone. Yeah. Yeah, we also know that certain kinds of food, especially foods high in sugar and fat, activate the reward pathways of the brain, right? There's a very powerful biological mechanism that causes us to turn towards food to regulate our emotions. And it's not a matter of just sort of scolding ourselves. And in fact, the other really important area of research that I think has come out is around the impact of weight stigma, both coming from other people and from ourselves. Huh. And there's some evidence that weight stigma or experiencing um, discrimination uh, because of one's shape or size has as important an effect on people's health as other major indicators like uh, their actual weight, for example. So it's really how we think about our bodies and uh, how hard or compassionate we are on it with ourselves around that that determines our psychological health and to some degree our physical health as well. But if weight stigma, as you mentioned, is something that's social, it's community-based, it's society-based, um, how do we take, that would require that society change, right? That we see cultural norms shift mm -hmm. and ecosystem shift. That seems very difficult. And it seems kind of like, I, I feel hopeless when I hear that because I, don't, I can't imagine this weight stigma changing that quickly, right? Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, how do we individually um, granted that the ecosystem needs to change, but how do we individually take steps uh, to, to change our attitudes in the face of a society that likes to stigmatize um, yeah. our size? I will say, um, I think that there is a broad cultural movement happening in relation to this. Um, it's commonly referred to as health at every size that really is about embracing the diversity of body shapes and sizes and a focus on health rather than a focus on weight and shape. And so connecting to other people who have that orientation, whether that be doctors or nutritionists or other people in your social media world who have that stance can be really healthy and calling out relationships that make you feel bad about yourself because of your weight or shape or size. Mm -hmm. um, removing those from your social media stream, for example, can be really powerful. But it's also about small personal daily acts of expressing gratitude towards your own body, of uh, not avoiding looking at oneself in the mirror, for example, which can be really difficult for some people to do, sort of creating space for your own acceptance and your own comfort. Um, many people do things that they think, they think that if they shame themselves, that will help them somehow in their quest for health. And we know that it's actually quite the opposite. So if you can let go of some of that self-recrimination, it creates a lot more space for you to envision what a healthy and happy relationship with your body and the food would look like. 
These are all great tips. If you, um, those of you who are watching, I know we have a lot of participants. So if you are watching and this sparks some questions for you, you can always tweet at me at Elise WHO and I'll be able to get uh, the questions to Dr. Keenan Miller before we wrap up this session in the last 10 minutes. But we'll continue the two of us for now. Um, you mentioned earlier that biologically we're sort of wired to crave high starch or high fat foods right now, these comfort foods that we're all running to. And plus everybody seems to be perfecting their sourdough starter right now, right? Yeah. So, um, and then, so that's one aspect of it, but the other is a lot of these sorts of um, uh, high calorie foods are less expensive, frankly. Yes. And um, so they're helping us emotionally, but also they're cheaper. So how do you help your patients budget um, financially and emotionally for more high impact or high nutrition foods? That can be a challenge. And I would say one of the things that lots of people are encountering during this time is that they don't have access to the kinds of health supporting foods that they would like to eat, either because they're not available or they don't have the money for them or they don't have the time to prepare them. And a little bit of compassion, again, for oneself goes a long way here of sort of saying like, this is an unusual time and I might need to eat in a way that isn't typical for me. But it's also, I think, um, an opportunity for lots of people to think more creatively about what kinds of food they enjoy and how to prepare them. Um, I think there's an actual opportunity in here, um, especially as we think about um, sort of potentially long-term systemic shifts in our food system. Like how do we get more connected to, um, to local foods, but also to eating less of things that um, like meat and more things like even canned beans that are really helpful and, um, and it's an opportunity for people to reimagine what their relationship with food is going to be like. And that's going to take some experimentation. It's not going to be perfect all the time. Um, and for some people, there may really need to be um, a reliance on some of the outside sources of support during this time, like our food banks, uh, to help them get what they need in terms of healthful and sustainable foods. Speaking of reimagining, a lot of folks are also trying to reimagine um, maybe the, their previous diets or previous workout routines, right? Mm -hmm. Because gyms and a lot of fitness centers are closed. How how does um, the fact that we don't have the same sort of exercise routines that we used to have affect this period um, and, and the way that we're eating now? Yeah. Um, the relationship between exercise and food is a really complex one. Um, but we do know that exercise improves um, the executive functioning of our brain, meaning our, our brain's ability to stop us from acting impulsively and allow us ah. to act in a goal-directed way, right? So giving up on exercise can really negatively impact um, one's relationship with food in that way. But I will say there's a lot of wonderful opportunities, I think, for people to find and even fall in love with new ways of moving their body that feel joyful and don't have to feel punishing. Um, you don't have to follow it like a regimen of a certain number of minutes or a certain number of calories. It's really just about moving your body in a way that feels joyful and healthful. And um, perhaps using this time to find an activity that normally you would never have done, but now you can learn by Zoom in the privacy of your own home um, or, you know, learning to fall in love with taking walks and runs in your neighborhood as well. I'm glad you mentioned this newness because some of the questions that we received prior to this event, just from folks who have RSVP'd, have to do with um, attempts to sort of change our lifestyle during this period. So one question had to do with um, an eating-related lifestyle change, such as going vegan or becoming a vegetarian during this time period. So um, do you recommend that? Do you recommend trying to kind of use this otherwise uh, big lifestyle change as an opportunity to change the way that we eat as well? I think a lot of people would find making additional changes really overwhelming. So it's certainly not something that I uh, would widely prescribe. Um, okay. But I think that if if you are have been contemplating making a shift like that and, and you want to use this time as a time to get it going, the most effective tool is to really think back to your values. So for example, if you're going to go vegan, why? What matters to you about going vegan? Is it about 
animal rights and animal cruelty? Is it about the environment? Is it about something specific to your health situation? What is it that really means something to you about it? And how do you stay in contact with that? Because there will be challenges. And we know that the people who are most in contact with their values are the people who are most likely to overcome those challenges and be able to stick with difficult behavioral changes. The other question that we got has to do with intermittent fasting, which is very hot right now, at least um, on our coast here on the West Coast, um, a lot of folks have been uh, doing this intermittent fasting or um, time restricted feeding, I guess is what people call it, where you wouldn't, you won't eat for 16 hours and then eat for eight or another um, 14 hours, 14 hours and 10 or something like this. So. Um, the question from one of our participants is just, would you recommend or is intermittent fasting um, something worth trying for weight loss? So um, I'm not a nutritionist and I wanna make that part clear, but I can tell you what the literature says about diets in the long right. run, which is almost any diet will work in the short term if you adhere to it. And mm -hmm. no diets work in the long term pretty much when we look at studies that last two years or more. And in fact, actually, most of those studies that look long term at people who have diet find that they end up weighing more than people who don't diet and have worse health profiles than people who don't start dieting, even when you control for people's initial weight. So there was a study of twins in Finland that found identical twins, one who dieted, one who didn't. The one who dieted ended up weighing more over time. Right. Um, and so I think when it, this particular diet, I've never seen any research that any particular diet follows a different pattern than that. Uh, the vast majority of the time, um, diets don't work in terms of weight loss in the long run, and sometimes they end up causing more weight gain. So I would encourage people to think, and, and certainly from a psychological standpoint, which is the standpoint I, I know best, um, diets are the primary reason, primary causal factor for a lot of binge eating. So people who put themselves onto diets end up being both in the short term and in the long term more at risk for developing a pretty unhealthy relationship with food. So I would urge a lot of caution and again, a focus on what do you do that supports your health around eating rather than what do you do to attain a certain number on the scale? I learned something as we were preparing for this panel um, from you, which is that even though we hear so much about anorexia or bulimia, or at least I did as a child of the 80s who grew up in the 90s, I heard about anorexia and bulimia a lot, that binge eating is actually the most common eating disorder in the US, if not other places as well. Um, how does that, how do we account for that? Is yeah. it because, yeah, because of all the dieting? Yes, actually, I think um, that's a big component of it. Um, and, you know, we didn't even really recognize binge eating disorder as a disorder in the psychiatric manual until 2015. So sort of um, growing up, lots of people never heard of this as a real problem, but it is yeah. three times as common as anorexia and bulimia. So there's, um, and then many, many million more people who don't meet all the criteria for the disorder, but who sometimes binge eat and who sometimes have difficulty with binge eating. So it is a very um, significant public health risk. Um, in terms of psychological outcomes. And I think one that people really need to be um, aware of and cautious of if they're going to choose to start dieting, that that could end up putting them on a trajectory uh, that leads to binge eating. I love that you're um, really hammering home this message of the potentially negative consequences of dieting. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, is this a license to just keep running to my fridge? Right. I love cheese. And right. so... <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, let me just echo the questioners here by asking, how do we prevent late night eating and excessive snacking? Because that's something that I think a lot of us can relate to right now. Yeah, right. And we don't want to swing from one end of restriction right. to like complete loss of control on the other end either, right? Um, there is a happy, healthy middle ground. Um, and a, around the question around late night eating, I get this question a lot, especially now. I would say first, make sure that your dinner is um, satisfying and that you're not awake too many hours after it. If you're going to be awake a long time after mm -hmm. dinner, you need to plan for a snack and plan for it so that you're choosing it in advance in a moment where you can really think through what it is that you want to eat. Um, and then if it's not really hunger that's causing late night eating, it's helpful to think, what is this about? Like, what is causing this? Am I eating for an emotional reason? And if so, 
can I make a different choice to manage that emotion? So if I'm feeling lonely, can I reach out to a friend to get connected? If I'm feeling bored, can I get reengaged in a task? And then finally, people have a lot of habits that happen late night. Um, and so they might sort of like zone out and eat an entire bag of chips without even realizing it in front of the TV. So think about how to break um, those environmental habits or, or cues for overeating at night. So that might mean um, getting in a bath where you're not gonna be eating instead of sitting in front of the TV for hours. It might mean sitting in a different chair and saying, when I'm sitting over here, this is like my non-eating chair. Um, <laughs> it might even mean just taking a, a portion of what you wanna eat out of its container and putting it into a smaller bowl so that you don't run the risk of sort of just eating without even realizing what you're doing, bringing a little bit more mindfulness to that moment. Fantastic. We have a question coming in on Twitter and I want to be mindful of time here because we sure. promised only a 20 to 30 minute session here. So um, at Mrs. Alex Brown asks, curious if meal prep and planning is productive in this time or just a false sense of, of a healthy approach. Should we just be focusing each day on what we're hungry for and keeping our options open or does meal or is meal planning kind of a feasible option as well? Uh, it depends a little bit on individual circumstances, I'd say, but I do think having some planfulness is a good idea if you can manage it, but you don't want to then take it on with such rigidity that you can't be flexible if what you're really wanting is something different in a moment or if something isn't available when you need it in the end. Um, so a balance between planning and flexibility, sort of that middle path, I think is where most people are going to find they can uh, both uh, follow a healthy eating goal and also uh, not not beat themselves up if they don't. It feels like our time has just flown by so quickly. Yes. Um, but I, so I want to wrap up by giving you an opportunity, Dr. Keena Miller, to uh, give us a couple tips to what do you want us to take away from the conversation that we've just had and um, the body of research that you were aware of? Yeah. Um, I think if I, if I could distill it down to a couple of points, it would be to treat uh, yourself with some compassion to really listen to your body as you're making food choices, which sometimes means eating the most healthful thing in front of you and sometimes means eating something lovely and delicious just because it's pleasurable. Sort of thinking about it across the spectrum of time instead of any one meal or any one day being good or bad, really thinking more flexibly and holistically. And then again, doing what you need to to support your emotional needs so that food isn't the primary way that you're coping with stress um, during this time. And one question that I just uh, realized that I didn't get to and I sort of signposted earlier that I want to make sure that we ask about is that there is some diet shaming going on on yeah. social media or even in our WhatsApp or text message groups, right? Like I'm yeah. in a group with some other moms and they send um, little messages about the COVID-15, mm -hmm. a reference to the freshman 15, right? Gaining sure. weight during, during COVID. So um, how sh what is your reaction to that? And how should we be reacting to um, kind of these cultural memes being passed around, around weight gain? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit on your relationship with the person um, who's sharing that kind of information for me personally and for clients, I recommend that they unfollow or disconnect from social media feeds that are making them feel bad about themselves. Um, if it's someone close to you that you're having an open conversation with, I think it can be helpful to say like, no, actually, I don't wanna think about it that way during this time or I'm finding those messages are sort of unhelpful or hurtful or I'm already experiencing a lot of stress without worrying about the number on the scale. Can we turn down that kind of conversation? Yeah. And it can be uncomfortable to make those, um, to set those sort of boundaries in our social relationships. But often when you do, I think you get a surprising sense of relief from the other person that also they have the permission not to foreground weight and shape and how they're thinking about themselves and about you in that relationship. Fantastic. If folks have additional questions, because I'm sure that this sparked more questions, how can they find you or how can they reach you? They can reach me by tweeting at me. Um, I'm at No Psychology on Twitter, and I would look forward to answering questions there. Fantastic. Dr. Keenan Miller, thank you so much for joining me and all of you who have joined us. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I want to remind y'all that you can rewatch this conversation after it's over at ucla.edu slash connections. Thank you so much.